Okay, it is 6 p.m. We will go ahead and get started. Let's open it in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your love for us. And tonight, as we come together, I ask that you would bring us back to the reason why we're here, to exalt your name, to exalt the name of your Son, Father. We fall short every day of your glory. We, we, we become sidetracked on peripheral things. We do not focus upon what you've called us to do sometimes, Father. I just pray that you bring us back, bring us back to the heart of the Word of God, to your heart, that we would seek to glorify you with our whole minds, our whole beings, our body and soul. Father God, as we continue to study your Word tonight, especially in this area of interpretation, that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit. May you give the students strength as we will be continuing the semester and they're so busy and they're tired. Father, I ask that you would just really keep us focused upon you. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, if we can just double check your mic. Hi, Danny, how are you? Great. Okay, everyone's here. Just make sure your mic is muted. And then if you have a question, of course, as always, you can unmute and interrupt. So, all right, so let's go ahead and get into... The session for tonight, I am excited for tonight's session. So we are, we are going to do the reading first. So the, the second reading, we're a little bit behind, but we'll do the discussion first on, on those who, who actually did the reading. The, the CT, the Certificate of Theology students, probably did not do the reading, but that's fine. I have a PowerPoint to highlight some main points so that we can discuss some significant uh, observations, some significant quotations, but we'll first discuss, I'll ask, I'll entertain your questions first. And um, just a quick overview for the direction of tonight. We will be, as I mentioned, doing uh, a discussion and highlights from the reading rules of interpretation and defining interpretation, de defining the rules, although I'm not so much focused on the, the definition because there's different definitions and we're not really following. Robert Stein, strictly, strictly speaking. Next, we will be discussing uh, the passages. So we'll be looking at the next step in our process, the passage location and the surrounding context. Or we, some people will say like a co-text study, a context study. And so it's not a context study, meaning that we're studying the, the cultural background or, or, the, or the, the background information, but that we're actually doing a study on where your passage is in relationship to the book in relationship to the outline in relationship to the argument of the author. So uh, this is actually very helpful in really further orienting you before we actually get into the steps. So you can imagine we've already had so many different steps up to this point, but again, it's sure that we're reading in context, that we're reading it appropriately. Okay. And then lastly, we'll discuss the homework and, uh, Hopefully we'll be done by then. I, I do want to go over some other things in relation to the homework. We can have a discussion at the end. So, so, so these are the purposes. These are the goals for tonight. For those who read uh, chapter one, rules of interpretation, chapter two, defining rules in a basic guide to interpreting the Bible plain by the rules, second edition by Robert Stein. I believe there's at least two who should have read, maybe three. Uh, what are your comments or observations? To expound on it, uh, yeah, I'm willing. Uh, as I was uh, reading the, that method, as I said, it is uh, similar. I agree it is similar to interpretation of laws, especially the Constitution, because that's universal. Uh, particularly on the use of meanings of the words, very similar. Yeah. But... Uh, there is uh, a deviation in the way the meanings are used in the Bible and the way the meanings are used in the Constitution or any law. And for that purpose, I made that comment because the purpose of the interpretation in the law and the Constitution is to see to it that the law enacted is in accordance with the Constitution. It is not the other way around. That's why, that's what, that's, that's why I made a strong comment yeah. that uh, there is a different purpose in the interpretation. So, to me, it is not, it is not, uh, there, is, there is something wrong in comparing the interpretation of the Constitution to the interpretation of the Bible or the words in the Bible because it has a different purpose. Yeah. Could, could we say, 
very clear in the law, it is to make sure that the law is made or is written in accordance with the Constitution. We do not, I don't think it is, it is uh, the same purpose in the Bible. We do not, we do not interpret the Bible to see to it that it is in accordance with uh, something written before. Because there's only one. There's only one uh, book we are talking about, the Bible. But in the Constitution, it is the source of many other laws. So when you enact a law, it should be in accordance with the Constitution. So it, is, it has a different purpose. So that's why I made that question. Would it be advisable if we use the interpretation of the Bible to interpret the Constitution or vice versa? Use the interpretation in the Constitution to interpret the Bible. We will be, we will be at a loss because these people, uh, as far as the law is concerned, these people are only trained to interpret the law as they learn it from a law school. But in the Bible, there are so many, so many, so many th things to consider. That's why, that's why, that's, that's the reason why there are so many commentaries, there are so many theories regarding the interpretation of the Bible, because we allow many people to interpret the Bible the way they see it fit, especially during the period of time. You remember the periods? Yeah. Every period, they have a different view, they have a different interpretation. In law, it cannot be that way. You cannot say the interpretation during the American uh, Civil War is different from during the French, during the American. No, 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 no. It's the same. It's the same all throughout. It's the same all throughout. That is what. That is why main comment. Uh, yeah. No, that's really good. So for those who did not read, there was a comparison in the comparing U.S. law and constitution to to uh, interpreting the Bible and the relationship of our interpretation to, to the Bible. So in the U.S., there's, there's a big debate. I don't want to go into all the details, but there's a big debate right now on whether you just interpret the, 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 the U.S. Constitution in its original context, or is it a living document that changes meaning with the culture? And so uh, that's a huge debate in the U.S., and, and, in men, and in some ways, there's a correlation with, 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 with uh, the word of God in that there's a, a reader response. The reader response gives new meaning that was not in the original context. So that, that was the correlation that the author was drawing between the two. We, we can see the correlation, but, but, but the, the difficulty is, as Kuya Bulboy pointed out, the, the issues are so much more complex in some ways, it's it, it seems to do it seems to be very deficient. Maybe we can use deficient. The word deficient. Uh, you also don't have the you don't have a two authorship component. You don't have the work of the Holy Spirit. So you know, looking at at the author, I, I do wish that maybe he had given a bigger caveat and said and and clarified the weaknesses and clarified the deficiencies. I think I think that would have done been. Uh, would have been better. And I do think he spent too much time on it as well. So that was one of my critiques as well. I just felt it was too much. Someone who's not reading this in a U.S. cult context would not really understand what's going on. <laughs> so, so in some ways, the book is limited to a, to a, US, to a U.S. context. So, but that point is really well taken. And it really speaks to the fact that that when Queer Boy said, like, the, the Word of God has been, has been in existence for thousands of years. Think about, you know, just the different culture over those several thousand years of its writing. And then we have the, 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 the history of interpretation is like double that because we have another 2,000 years of church tradition. We have 2,000 years of the Jews interpreting it as well. So, I mean, there's just so much stuff to sift through. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point, Koya Boboy, and that, that point is well taken. Anyone else want to make a comment from the reading? Uh, maybe you disagree with Koya Boboy and you want to interact. You know, I think I think we're on strong ground here to agree. But um, this is a time where I, I want you to be. I don't want you to be afraid. Those who read, feel free to. That's part of our process. Hey. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had it in mind early. Uh, no. Um, the way I see it somehow, like particular with prophecy, in terms of interpretation, it often comes out as it unfolds, right? 
as can you just repeat as it as it un unfold yeah yeah so in that way th that would make interpretation for the bible something talaga na ch it changes over time uh that's speaking for prophecy huh? speak depending on the book probably but for other kinds of books it has to be interpreted at the way it was uh it was said, or the intention it was said during that time. Would you say that, that's where that's where I disagree? That's why I would I disagree uh, on that ray on that line of interpretation because the Bible does not change over time, but laws change over time. That's why you have to interpret the subsequent law in relation to the Constitution. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The same as the Bible because the Bible did not change. You just mm. you just changed the, the the translation. There was just a phase of translation, and that's why there was a, a use of words because of the translation. That is the cause of so many interpretation. But the mm. Bible did not change. That's why we should not change the mm. meaning or the interpretation from the way it was written from by the author, whether it was the human author you're talking about or the guide of the Holy Spirit you're talking about. I don't think it has changed. I mean, I was ang ano ko kaya is yung ano ba yung like for example for for mga revelation type or vision type usually at at at, uh, at this point in time there are kinds of uh, there are words written there that are not very clear but it only becomes clear as the the the, the event itself unfolds so the way it is interpreted will really be uh, clearly identified as it happened for other kinds of books, it has to, the interpretation will really be the same as it was. I don't know. How, how do you go about that thing? So, so hold on. So I think that it was just a, a poor choice of Ray's words. I don't think Ray was saying, as I understood Ray, I don't think Ray was saying that the, the, interpret, the interpretation like changes from one to another over time. I think what Ray was clarified himself is that in time, there's more clarity and, and that meaning really comes into actuality. So, so in an earlier era, maybe people did not know the full meaning. And mm. so it changes in the sense of clarity, not in different, not in another, but in, 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 uh, in focusing, maybe focusing is the best, focusing is the best word. Um, I, 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 yeah, so, so I would agree with, oh boy, we don't, we don't want to say change, in the sense that it's a different interpretation. Anyone else want to get on this? This is really good. This is this is good. Anyone else want to add? Any other for those who read? Does anyone else want to add? Okay, uh, Pastor Henry, go ahead. Okay, in until un, uh, up to the present, there are still discoveries, ar archaeological discoveries. In well, this give uh, well this matter the interpretation which was done years. Before. Okay, great question. So, with new archaeological interpretation, uh, new ar archaeological finds, does that change interpretation? So, great question. I have one example, and I am becoming more and more, uh, more and more uh, committed to this, to this, to this interpretation, which it is different compared to how church history has historically interpreted this passage of scripture. But we would not say that it's different from the original meaning. Meaning to say that maybe the archaeological evidence wasn't there. It was a bad interpretation that church tradition held. And then with the archaeological discovery, that real meaning came out. So the specific example is Melchizedek. Melchizedek that's mentioned in Hebrews. And I think maybe I'm going to change from, I don't know. I can't remember my position. I think I took the, the traditional position. In, uh, in our class early in the year, that Melchizedek was a type of Christ, that, that, that Christ, it was a, a Christophany, meaning to say that Christ appeared and, and um, uh, as Melchizedek, and then Abraham gave the tithes, uh, uh, there's the blessing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, from Genesis chapter, I believe, 14. Okay, now, uh, there's new archaeological evidence that there's actually... There was this, this city of Salem, which is, the, which is the earliest city from Jerusalem, and that there was a king. <laughs> there was a king. So, so, you know, 
I am actually, you know, I have to, st I haven't really studied it thoroughly, but I would say that my interpretation now tentatively, you know, I'm holding that, I'm holding that, I'm giving the caveat because they haven't you know, done a thorough study. I would say that Melchizedek was a real priest king. He was a real priest king to the, to, 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 uh, to the Lord. And he was a historical figure. And, and so in, in, he was a type of Christ in that his personality, his person uh, prophesied of the coming Christ, not that he was Christ in a Christophany, a, a pre-appearance of Christ. So that would be one example where the archaeological evidence actually discovers discovers evidence for this and, and it clarifies our interpretation. Without that, we don't really know, you know, it, it's not as clear. It's not as clear. Although to be clear, to be clear, he is presented in Genesis as a real person. And, and it's just because of the comparison and types that people will say, oh, he's, he's this, he's, he's a Christophany because he's, it says that he's without genealogy, without mother, without descent. So, so people, there's still, still debate in that interpretation. Some people still say it's a Christophany. So both both have issues. So, yeah. My my comment on that as uh, team on the archaeological findings is, to me, it's a confirmation of yeah. whatever interpretation they had before prior to this discovery. Because, like what you said, when you discuss about Melchizedek and Salem, did it really exist? The archaeological findings will prove that there was such a city called Salem. So if the existence of the place is confirmed by archaeological findings, then, then the, the next evidence is, does it follow that all the stories about that city also are true or real? That is, that is part of the discovery because of the archaeological findings. That is to me how I understood and helpful these archaeological findings are in, the, in helping uh, interpret Bible uh, events. Yeah, no, that's true. And I want to I want to add a caveat. We don't want to place all our weight on archaeological evidence because people interpret archaeological evidence differently. And so if all our weight, all our trust and rest on archaeology, which is which is imperfect, which which is in some sense interpretation of history, because it's not they have some evidence, but it's very some of it's missing. We don't want to rest our our belief in the Old Testament. Our belief in the Word of God is by faith. Hebrews eleven, by faith. Okay, but that's, that's why I use that's why I use the word confirm. Yeah, exactly. No, and so that I'm I'm agreeing with you, clear boy, boy. This idea that archaeological evidence will agree or confirm, but we don't want to place the evidence underneath. <laughs> we don't want to place it as the foundation. We want to say that 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 this is a separate and it attests to the the, the validation of of this separate reality yeah. agree agree i agree great excellent discussion anyone else want to add anyone else want to add to this well i think from what from i've read especially from the book of uh josh mcdonnell I think yeah. he has a criteria for using to support the claims of the Bible. So I think it's true with what Kuya Bubuyer said earlier. I think we cannot discount the importance also of these like uh, tools. But I think otherwise, we might just be uh, <gasps> believing blindly. Yeah. Not, right? So yeah. still, there's what? an importance to you of using these tools. Yes, yes, there's an importance of using it, Ray, but also, also, we need to recognize that even if there was a strong archaeological evidence to confirm even beyond the shadow of doubt that Jesus was resurrected, that will not save a person. People will not believe even, even if he were to rise from the dead. So, so we also have to recognize that, that no evidence no evidence will convince someone because at the end of the day, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that transformed the heart and no external evidence can ever, can ever do that. So, so we, we, we do, we do have to hold that, but I, yeah, but I like what you're saying with Josh McDowell that he's using evidence to, to support, um, 
you know, there's actually, we could have apologetics class. There's two, wait, uh, there's two uh, schools of thought, a, presu a presuppositional apologetics and then the evidential apologetics. And presuppositional really, really looks at uh, worldviews and says your, your worldview is faulty. It, 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 it's totally, two totally different uh, perspectives, and we can discuss that in another class. Um, apologetic. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do that <laughs> one day. <gasps> Man, good. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Sunny. Um, yeah. Also, uh, we have to be very careful in, when, we, when we take the, you know, the archaeological background because there are so many scholars that would, you know, would give a high view on, on the historical background rather than the canonical, you know, uh, approach of, of the scripture. What I mean is that we cannot use the, the, the archaeological evidence to prove the inspiration of the Bible. Yes, that's true. We, yeah. It, it cannot, it cannot, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, the inspiration is also what we, ha we are holding to uh, because it is God who really um, spoke, then act, and also interpret his, his word. I, th I think I, I believe on this, in this pattern that God, God spoke and then he, he act and also he, he interpreted his own word so that uh, the, 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 the whole counsel of, of God will not be uh, you know, ambiguous in, in the sense that, uh, you know, the overarching narrative, the, the plan of salvation is, is really um, important for us to understand also. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's also no, that, helpful too. No, that's, that's really good. That's, re that's another good point, Sonny. And, and yeah, that, that, the point is well taken. Anyone else from the, from the reading, any, any other comments or questions? about the rules of interpretation. If not, we can- I have a question. Go ahead, Mark, go ahead. Pastor Tim, um, about the interpretation of the Bible and interpretation of the laws, how does it differ with each other when our laws is also derived from the Bible, especially um, the 1987 Constitution is influenced by the American Constitution, which is also um, influenced by the laws in, of the Bible. So let me repeat does, your question. Let me, how does it differ from me? Okay, so you're saying you're saying uh, your question is concerning how is us making laws or practices from the Bible, which is which has commands. How is that different than the Constitution, which also has laws that are that are derived from the from the Constitution? Is, is that is that your, you're saying how is yes. that? Yes. Yes, Mr. Tim. Yeah, so, so the, the big difference would be that, that in the sense that, they're, that both the Bible and the Constitution are the foundation, those are the source, those, are, those would be the source text, the, the authority, the authority essentially, that would be analogous. And, and creating laws versus us creating specific practices again those would be somewhat analogous where it becomes different is the, the fact that you have the the holy spirit is not obviously is not present whereas the the the, the word of god has been has come to us over thousands of years the constitution was created at one time and it was very specific and, and it was also very general. It just gave general guidelines. And then you had specific uh, case law that was created. With the Bible, the Bible was, has both general principles and commands and then specific case law intrinsic within it. And then you're just making, we're making, uh, we're following patterns and rules in connection with both those commands and that specific the specific commands and context. I don't know if that's making sense. So th there's there is a there is an analogy between the two, but it's really deficient, as K Koya Bulboy mentioned. And uh, uh, yeah, so we just have to be really careful making a, a strong comparison. Hi, good evening. This is Alex. Alex, go ahead. <laughs> Can I make an additional comment with that with the last question of Mike? In interpreting the laws, I hope uh, Bobo will agree with me. There is this statutory construction, okay? The, 
it's a contextual basis actually. It's analogous also to the Bible because I just will just sign a few principles like rationally is, is anima. It's in the Bible. It it should be the spirit rather than the letters because the letters killed, but the spirit gives life. It's one interpretation. And there's another is the principle that uh, interpretation principle that the is it means that uh, if the law doesn't need then there's no need for further interpretation and that's literal interpretation in, in the bible we have literal and we have also spiritual like you know prophecy it, it's not literal it's figurative so it doesn't have to be it's analogous to a certain extent but as far as the jurisprudence is concerned or the generally the law of the land or how the supreme court rules every scenario it's it's a context, it's the case-to-case -case basis. Yep. But on the Word of God, it should always be interpreted in accordance with the Spirit of God. The Word of God and the Spirit of God, there's no contradiction with that. That is yeah. just my take. No, and that's a good point. And that, that's a good, uh, maybe that's a good additional point. I'm not a law expert, so I, I, I cannot, <laughs> I'm not an attorney, so. Thank you, Attorney yeah. Alex. David, 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 Dr. Alex, Alex is now a doctor, JD, JD, you rich doctor. Good. Okay, if, if, there's, if there's no other comments, uh, I think we had a good discussion. Okay, all right, uh, so let's, let's go ahead on, and um, I have some other quotations I want to make from the reading, and we can discuss these as well, so this, is, this will be helpful for those who did not do the reading. This will be a little bit of a summary, and, and maybe we can have some more dialogue. So, so Stein brings out this idea of what is required for communication. That's really how he begins his chapter. And so I'll just, I'll just quote this, this, give this quotation. In all communication, three distinct components are necessary. If any one of these is lacking, communication is impossible. These components are the author, the text, and the reader, or as linguists prefer to say, the encoder the code and the decoder. And there are, there are other ways of describing this, the sender, the message, the receiver, the speaker, the speak, the speech, and the listener. So Stein says that in order for communication to occur, there, there are three, the, the, the author, the text, and then the listener or the, or, the, or the audience. And I think this is helpful. This is helpful for us as we think through as we speak, public speak, as we preach, and especially as we study the Word of God, interpret the Word of God, I did, add, I did add one. I added one. This is not original to me. I think John Walton brought this up. I could be wrong. Um, I think John Walton brought this up in one of his books the, the concerning uh, Genesis. But anyway, I'll, I, don't have the con I don't have the quotation, and I'm not really quoting him, but um, I would add a fourth. The fourth is a common culture. A common culture. Uh, if, uh, and what I mean by, if I, if I can define culture, it's uh, common beliefs, worldview, and practices. Okay? So, to be very specific, okay, uh, if, if, a ter if attorney bull boy is going to speak to attorney in prospect, I think, right? Alex is getting close to becoming an attorney, right? If they're to speak, there, of course, someone is the speaker, there's the speech, and then there's the receiver. But the fourth is really important, this culture. I don't have the language, I don't understand the culture of being to say that all the different surrounding contexts of lawyers and case law. And so attorney... Oh boy, could speak to me. Maybe I could understand most of it, but I couldn't understand all of it. Uh, to, to take a more extreme example in this, imagine trying to describe electricity to a, a tribal person that does not have electricity. You could not explain because you don't have a common culture. There's no common, there, there isn't these common constructs that, that, that can, can, uh, bridge the gap you would have to use maybe uh maybe a vine it's like a river you know you can stop the river you can start the river there's power in the river you know it's running through the vine and there's a coconut in the house 
and you know, you, what I'm trying to get at is that really culture is that fourth component. So I like his quotation that you need a speaker, a, a, a message, and a, a, a listener or a reader, but there is also this common culture. And so for us in interpretation, uh, if we don't understand the culture of the reader and the author, then we can't really understand the context of what's going on. And sometimes that's why, that's why we really are confused with what's happening in the context because we're not, we're, we're reading the words. It doesn't really make sense to us, but it's because we're not actually trying to identify that culture. And so th there are some, there are some contexts that really make perfect sense once you understand culture. So I'll give one example really quick. One example, we'll go back to the Abraham example because, uh, because, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, we already talked about it. So Abraham, right? Abraham, he gives a tithe to Melchizedek, and he blesses. He I think he blesses Melchizedek, um, uh, and he receives a blessing from Melchizedek, one or the other. But but there's this relationship there. I think he he receives a blessing from Mel Melchizedek. Blesses him, okay. And uh, and but but with the king of Sodom, he won't take anything. He won't take anything from him. And he says that he says that. No, I'm not taking anything from you because you'll say that you made, you made me rich. And I always thought about this, like, I thought about this coming from a U.S. culture. I'm like, why wouldn't he take it? You know, he spent all this money. He rescued them. He deserves that, you know. But then after, after being here in a Philippine context, he doesn't want to take anything from Sodom because he doesn't want to have Utang. He doesn't want to have Utang. He doesn't want Utang to the king of Sodom. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't, he doesn't want that debt because then the king of Sodom will say, ah, I made you rich. You owe me, right? He doesn't want, he doesn't want to have any type of, of debt to, to the king of Sodom. Okay. I couldn't really understand that story because we don't have this concept of utang as much in the U.S. context. We don't have that. You have that here. So it's easier for you to see that, that, um, that cultural what's going on behind, between the words. That's the culture. That, that's really making sense why Abraham won't take the, top, won't take the gift from the king of Sodom. But, but that's an example where we really have to understand the culture. It's, the, there's, there's, it's more than the author, the message, and the reader. There's this, cultural, uh, this culture component. So there's a lot of examples, especially in the Old Testament, where the culture is very helpful, very illuminating, it really brings out meaning. So the big takeaway is that cultural studies Understanding Bible backgrounds, doing research in, in the, into the culture during that time is, is actually can be very illuminating. Okay, so I, 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 that's something important, a big takeaway that I want all of us to, to consider. And I, I, hope you, I hope that uh, for those who don't have the reading, maybe you can take some notes uh, for yeah. that. I, I have a comment on that. Dave. Right, right. Yeah, uh, culture, as, uh, as you call it, as uh, a means of understanding is very helpful only, as far as I'm concerned, only in relation to certain practices in certain places. But it will be very, very dangerous as well if you use the cultural practice to interpret other aspects, especially like in the Bible, using cultural experience and cultural practices. Because if you look at the Old Testament practices, especially the pagan practice, most of those practices are not acceptable by God. That's why there was this big trouble, especially the Jews. They were, remember, they were bluntly uh, directed, do not intermarry. Do not intermarry with non-Jews. And it's very, to the Jews, why? They are the same. They are, <laughs> so that's, 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 that's my take when you use uh, cultural practices to interpret certain Bible principle. But to me, cultural uh, practices is, is helpful in interpreting certain practices then that were mentioned in the Old Testament. Yeah, no, that, that's a good clarification, Cody Bullboy. And I want to make a further clarification. Uh, when I'm saying culture, it could be anything. It could be the culture of the first century church. It could be the culture of the Jewish culture. Yeah, it's not just pagan cultural practices. It's everyone has a culture. You have American church culture. We have Philippine church culture. You have Philippine family church culture. You have, do you see what I'm saying? You have, you have subcultures. So it's, again, 
you, and I and and Koya Boboy's point is well taken. I'm just emphasizing the fact that it, whenever there is a communication, it's through culture, and, and there's many different kinds of cultures. So we have to be aware of that, and, and of course, aware of what Koya Boboy is also saying that we should not. We should be very, especially careful when we're dealing with fallen pagan man culture. Especially careful. That's the most. Yeah, delicado telega. So no, great, great, great clarification. Okay. Remember the common saying. Remember the common saying: When you're in Rome, do what the Romans do. It's very well, dangerous. It's true. It's they, they, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Can I make an additional comment also with you, yeah. Boboy? Go ahead. The the culture in the Old Testament. I think you know this very well. David and Solomon got a lot of wives. Yeah. So if we're reading right now, okay, so is it acceptable? I mean, that, that kind of culture, I took up a Kairos course with Samaritans first, and to me, understanding the culture of like every country is helpful for us to penetrate, to approach, to somehow understand and share the gospel, but not necessarily like really living out the culture. Yes. As far as understanding them, yes. as far as understanding them, reaching them out, Excellent. Especially if it's cross-cultural, yes. it's very important that we know the culture. No. To some people, the culture is to kill people. <laughs> so that's quite dangerous. Yeah, no, that's really good. And, and so, yeah, we, we should study culture to understand, but not to practice necessarily. Not to practice necessarily. So, yeah, no, that's, again, a great qualification. So we should be <laughs> should be taking notes uh, anyway okay let's move on we're, we're, the, the time is flying from us so the next thing is where is meeting located so the next question that the author is uh, d discusses in the reading is where is meeting located and there's several poss there's several possibilities here and so you know everyone will maybe maybe you'll give maybe you will give the right answer but i really want us to think about this because we all fall into this trap Think about in your previous times that you study, where, where have in the past, where have you placed meaning? Um, uh, let's think about that as, as I give the possibilities. Number one is meaning is the property of the text, meaning that, meaning that uh, all that's necessary, the, the meaning is found only within the context of the text. That's where the meaning is found, okay? The second place is, Meaning is determined by the reader. So it doesn't matter what the author said. It doesn't matter what the text says. The reader is king. So if you can imagine, number one, the, the, the text is king. Number two, the reader is king. He makes all the determinations. And then the third possibility is the author is king. The author is king. And so just thinking about this, what do you think? This is maybe a, a dull question, but who should be king? <laughs> Number three is the king. Yeah, King Jesus. The author. The author. <laughs> no, so what I want us to be thinking about is if the author is king, right, there's really two authors. There's the living, uh, there's, there's God, the, the divine author, the human author, okay? If, if, if the author is king, then that really places a burden upon us to not focus upon our application, to not focus upon our needs, to not focus upon what we, when people start saying, I feel the text means this. I'm always like, I don't care what you feel. <laughs> Is that what the text says? You know, you know, to, to me, the text is dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. It's very dangerous. Yeah. So we need to, we all fall into this trap before, but we need to get back to uh, recognizing the author is king and, and the text has authority but only in as far as we're reading it in line with the original intent of the author okay so we need to be thinking about that original intent of the author we have access to his original intent through the text so there is authority in the text but only so far as it's we're understanding it in the context of the authori of authorial intent. Uh, let's move on here. The purpose of biblical interpretation involves understanding not just the specific conscious meaning of the author, 
but also the principle which he sought to communicate. So, th so to, be, to, to try to clarify this for us, it's not simply saying, what is the literal meaning of the text? That doesn't get at the issue. What we want to ask is, what was the principle that the author was trying to convey? Okay, so we have perfect examples of this in the New Testament, reading the Old Testament, specifically the law, right? So, so the biggest example of this being Matthew chapter 5, right? The, the great, you have heard it said, but I say. Uh, and so Jesus was dealing with the, 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 the true intention of the Mosaic law, the true intent of the principle that the law was trying to convey. The law literally said, thou shalt not murder, right? And so people read it wooden literal. Oh, I can curse my brother. I can, I can hate my brother. That's fine, as long as I don't physically kill him. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. If, if, if you're hating him, you're still, you're still violating the, 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 the meaning, the intention of the law. And so this is what Alex was saying earlier about the spirit of the law, okay? And so for all of, for all of the, the, the scripture, we need to be thinking, what? It's not just the literal meaning. That, 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 that doesn't always get at what is the principle that is being taught. Uh, God and also the human author. Next. The divine meaning of the bibl biblical text is the conscious willed meaning for God. So, so this, is, this is, I think, where I might disagree a little bit with Stein. So let's read this here and let's discuss it. The divine meaning of the biblical text is the conscious will meaning of God's inspired prophets and apostles for the role of the Holy Spirit in writing and interpreting the Bible. To understand then is to understand the conscious meaning of God's inspired servants who wrote it. It is not behind, beyond the meaning of the biblical text wish to share that we find the divine voice of God in scripture. And so I actually disagree with I disagree here with, with Stein on this point. Uh, if I were to clarify, I would probably say uh, most of the time. <laughs> uh, you can't, I, I, to me, it's a foul. You can't equate the two. You can't equate the two. We, we, we looked at 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12 last week, correct? We, we looked at that passage last week. Let me just, I'm just going to bring it back up and just, refresh ourselves because this is really I, I alluded to this passage here and I, I do want to go back to this passage again so I'm just going to read this and you tell me so this, this is the I'm going to read the quotation again and then you tell me if you agree or disagree and maybe you do agree and so I you know this is my this is my you know this is my perspective and I'm not I don't want to force it upon you uh, but the quotation again is the divine meaning of the biblical text is the conscious will meaning of God's inspired prophets and apostles. To understand then is to understand the conscious meaning of God's inspired servants who wrote it. So he's saying uh, God's, God's intention equals the prophet's intention and will. They both, it's, it, he's equating the two, okay? So Look at verse 10 to 12 and, and tell me if, that, if this fits or maybe this quotation is deficient. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the, Holy, the, the Spirit of Christ in them was, was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through the preaching, uh, for, for, for those who preach the good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things to which angels long to look. So here it doesn't seem to be equated, right? They don't know, and it's like they just realize, okay, we're, there, we're, I, we're saying it. We don't know what we're saying. We're serving you. We're serving you. It's being announced later, right? It's, it's, it's the things that have have now been announced. So I, I, I don't agree with this because there is 
again, going back to what Kuya Ray was saying, in prophecy, there is the prophets sometimes speak better than they know. They don't know God's ultimate divine purpose. They, 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 they don't know the fullest sense of it. Um, let's go to one other passage of scripture. Any, any comments or questions on that? Everyone's tracking. Let's go to Romans chapter. We read this before, but I just want to read it again. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Uh, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. So again, it's just, I, I find it a, a really hard stretch to, to have this one-to-one -one meaning. I, I just feel like that's, that's a really hard, that's a hard interpretation. I, I don't agree with Stein on this point. You know, Stein's purpose, though, is to really protect authority and intent and to protect the original context. Fair enough. I, you know, it's not malicious, but I just feel that, I feel that he's, he's, he's making an inference that we, we just, we should not accept. So I did that, that, if I was doing a, a reading, that would have been one of my, that would have been one of my uh, points of disagreement on. Uh, let's move on here before we take our break. We're, we're getting near uh, another quotation here. An error... That reference, uh, that, that reference to the conscious meaning of the author seeks to avoid involves the opposite claim that the Bible should be interpreted literally at all times. This too is an error for it loses sight of the fact that the biblical writers use various literary forms in their works, such as proverbs, poetry, and hyperbole, par parables. They never intended their readers, that their readers should interpret such passages literalistically. So this is a caveat which I like. He's, he's saying that we sometimes read too much literally. And he's, he's offering a caveat concerning the role of the author that we have to read it in the, in the context of the genre. We talked about genre. That's the literary type. Genre is literary type. You could say literary structure, literary form. That's essentially what genre is. So there's different genres. You can have sub-genres, which are just a, it's, um, it's, it's a specific context within a, a broader genre. So, um, so for example, uh, you could have parables in the broader genre of gospel. You could have allegory. You have allegories in the Old Testament. You could have allegory in the broader context of historical narrative. So, but, but we do need to be on guard from reading literalistically and especially in prophetic and visionary, and visionary genre. Okay, we have to be very careful that we're not, we're not reading. And, and it's also true with parable as well. It's also true with parable. We have to be careful about that. Let's go on. We have a couple more quotes and we'll be done. Okay, here's another one. Okay, so this is an example. This is the one from last week. The, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is to be interpreted as a parable. And thus, according to the rules governing the interpretation of parables, it is not to be interpreted as, as a historical account. So this comes back to past, uh, Pastor Henry's comments about, about getting the genre right or wrong and also about the comment now concerning uh, making a bad interpretation. We do need to read it within the genre. So it's identified as a parable and uh, we need to read it as such. And so we discussed that last week. If you have a question, I'm going to refer you to last week's, last week's video. It's on YouTube. <laughs> you can do that. Go watch the portion on, on uh, our question and conversation from, from last week if you have a further question there. Okay, next, we're almost done here. Uh, reader, the reader seeks to understand what the author meant by these symbols. So the role of the reader, the role of the reader is not to create new meaning, to not create meaning for themselves. It's to really understand what the author meant by the words and the context. Okay, so our job is not to create new meaning. We're not inventors we're not artists in that sense in, in in a large sense we're investigators we're observers we're observers we synthesize we, we make observations we ask questions and then we synth synthesize and then explain we can be expositors we can be investigators we're not artists we're not making new meaning okay so so i do want to really emphasize that continuing on here seeing how the words are used in phrases and sentences uh, or sentence 
how the sentences are used within paragraphs, how paragraphs are used in chapters, and how chapters are used in a work. The reader seeks to understand the, understand the author's communicative intent in writing this work. So, so the job is to look at how the phrases relate, how, how the phrases relate in a sentence, how the sentences interrelate in a paragraph, how the paragraphs interrelate in a pericope or a discourse, how all of that relates in a book. Okay, so that's our job. This process, because there's an interrelationship there, looking at sentences, looking at phrases, looking at clauses, looking at paragraphs, this is called the hermeneutical circle. The hermeneutical circle, okay? Uh, later you'll read a book, The Hermeneutical Spiral. So that it's, it's, a, slight, it's a, a slight modification to the hermeneutical circle. But this expression refers to the fact that the whole text helps the reader understand individual words or parts of the text. In turn, the individual words and parts help us understand the meaning of the text as a whole. So there's, there's an interplay between the big meaning and the specific context. So that's why it's so important that when you prepare your sermon, when you prepare your Bible lesson, you cannot look at that passage by itself. You cannot. You have to look at it in its broader context. If you're, if you're teaching on an overview of a book, you have to look at the specifics. There's this interplay between the two. If you don't, if you don't play that dance of looking at the interplay between the two, you're going to fail. You're going you're gonna to miss the point. It's so important. So I just really want to stress that, that there is this interplay. And later tonight, we're going to be getting into that. You're, you're going to see, I have, a, I have a, an exercise to really help you practice this so you're gonna i'm gonna force you i am gonna force you to practice this dance of looking at the big picture and then your specific context so next the next session we will the next portion of this session we will be working on this you'll, you'll see um, that's it that's all i have so chapter two was really defining terms i don't have those definitions here because you know at the end of the day some of the definitions were different than what we have and because we're not using his book as the primary method, it, I just felt it would, it would kind of in some ways confuse you. Uh, if you want to look at the definitions, I can send you the PDF. But I just, I just felt that even the way he was using some words, they were differently than what we're going to see later. So I just didn't want to confuse. Um, everyone has a different method. Any comments or questions before we take our first break? Uh, I hope this is making sense. I hope you learned something from the reading. Uh, any comments or questions before we, we go in our first break? This is Alex, Dean. Okay, Alex, go ahead. Uh, I got lost when you were, you were explaining. Allow me to clarify your stand. You're saying that the prophet cannot, it doesn't equate with God's intention. It, he cannot really fully grasp what God was really trying to say. Is that what you stand? Yes, yeah, so specifically... In the prophets, when it says, thus says the Lord, and then there's this prophecy, either of judgment or salvation, yeah. In those contexts, the, the prophet is just repeating what God's saying, but there's no way he knows what the ultimate intent or the intent of God is, yeah. I think I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you with that. This is just my understanding about the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, I don't think there's a prophet who really captures the whole picture of what God's trying to say. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Paul was saying that we can only like see a part and even Jesus we're talking about this scatology about the end times he said only the father knows this is Jesus already saying so please connect with them I have a wrong interpretation but I, I agree with you that I think no prophet can really fully graph or like completely capture the picture of God's message trying to convey to the humanity yeah I don't know. Yeah, no, no, yeah. So I just, let me just, let me just tweak. I always want to tweak what you're saying. I'm just going to tweak it a teeny bit, okay? So I would say that the big picture we, we have, because it, is, it has been revealed to us in Christ. So, so, so we have the big picture in Christ and through his apostles. Specifics, uh, there are some specifics we don't know because it has not been revealed, okay? But, but, but just to, to, to further clarify, when, when the prophets would predict 
salvation and judgment. So all through the Old Testament, you can go through each prophet. And there's just massive sections of thus says the Lord to Israel. Thus says the Lord. And then he'll go through this, this description of, of judgment or this description of restoration. The prophet is literally just, it's like oral dictation. Go say this, right, to, 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 to Jonah. Go say this to Nineveh, right? So Jonah is literally just giving the words of, of God. Now, some of it's very clear. Some of it's not clear. Re repent and, and trust in me. That's clear. But specific prophecies, the, the prophet, he's on a need-to-know basis. He doesn't know everything. And so, you know, Stein, Stein is trying to protect from just going into allegory. Stein's trying to protect from going into allegory. Oh, because it's the divine author, we can, the, the sky is the limit to what we mean. And so his, his point is well taken, and I, and I agree with him that we should start in the historical grammatical uh, process. But when you get to the New Testament, and especially Paul says the gospel was the mystery that was hidden for many secrets of ages past, has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings. There was something in there that was not clear until the coming of Christ, okay? And so yeah. that's the tweak. Um, yeah. Sir, Sir Tim, can I, can I also uh, um, comment on this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just uh, um, what, what I have understand from Stein's point of view is that um, uh, it seems to me that uh, he's trying to say that when, whenever the prophets or the apostles and um, Moses speak, their God also speak. Yeah. Uh, when, when the author um, wrote uh, the, 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 the Bible, the authors wrote the Bible, their God is also, um, you know, the voice of God is there. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually reading this book, uh, the title is the, of this is the, uh, the Canon, Covenant, and Christology. Yeah. Uh, it was written by David Peterson and, you know, uh, edited by D.E. Carson. So he, he just give a three, uh, he, just, he just give a framework on, on how, how does this happen. Uh, there is the act, uh, uh, there is a word, act, word pattern where he says that God speak, which is the word, and also God acts through, by, by what God says, he, he also acts on it. And also he give an interpretation of what he is doing. Uh, let's say, for example, when, when God gave the covenant to Abraham, he also act yeah. uh, on that covenant. And also he interpreted that covenant. Yeah. And if we read the, the whole council of, of, of the 66 book of the Bible, we see the pattern, that, uh, that, that the, the same pattern where God uh, gave the, you know, the word and also he acted through, by, uh, through the covenant relationship with, the, with, with Abraham and also the, the Israelites. And also he interpreted it in, in the New Testament. Yeah. And uh, with regards to the uh, um, prophetic writing, he actually gave the three uh, frame, uh, formulas on how does it done. For example, uh, the first one is the messenger formula where we read the word, thus says the Lord. So it's, it's like a commission, uh, God commissioning the prophet, yeah. you know, to be a prophet, to, to be his word, or to be his, yeah. um, you know, his uh, spokesperson. Uh, so that is a messenger type uh, formula. The second formula that he says is the what we call the narrative formula, the narrative formula where we can read the word like like this: uh, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah or mm -hmm. came to, you know, uh, th th that's that's the second uh, formula. And the third one is the which is very, uh, you know, um, give to the uh, 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 address to this issue is the the disjunct that this. Disjunctive uh, hiddens or, or the disjunctive hiddens, yeah. where uh, we could read also in the prophetic book, like the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Okay, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, it seems it seems like um, what in the connection to what Stein said, uh, you know, the conscious meaning while in the conscious meaning meaning uh, what what this author also trying to conclude in his in his book is that um, which is I also agree. Uh, when when the prophets speak, when the apostles speak, there God also speak. So I think, uh, how, yeah, that's that's my take on this. No, so so, but but are you saying that the book that you're reading is agreeing with him that 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 it's one to one? I'm just trying to understand. Actually, 
the, the, the things that I uh, actually, as, as I understood the book, um, he was trying to say, uh, he was advocating to the dual authorship of, of the Bible, where, uh, you know, uh, God and God has used this, the, the human author to realize or to, to actualize the, 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 you know, the message of, of, of the Bible. Where uh, God is uh, again, uh, it, it's really uh, uh, coined to one 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 statement that uh, when God, when when the author of the Bible speaks, there also God speaks. So yeah, yeah, uh, in, yeah. yeah, so that's that's it. But, yeah, no, so so we, we would I would agree with that. When God speaks, when when the author, if God's speaking through the author, when God speaks, when the author speaks, God speaks. Yeah, but. I think Stein's taking it a step further. So going back to this quotation, the divine meaning of the biblical text is the conscious will meaning of God's inspired prophets and apostles. And I don't, what I'm trying to say is that from the New Testament perspective, you can't equate the two. It could be, but it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily, you can't, you can't make that inference is what I'm trying to say. Oh yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah. So, but again, just think about it. Let's think about that. Um, let's take a break. Let's go ahead. Let's begin. I want to stay lastly, just to kind of bring all this together, to get really into this, the, the, the nitty gritty here, the details, okay? What I'm trying to, to propose is that, so for example, uh, when we interpret the prophets, you can't interpret the prophets without considering Christ. That's the big takeaway. Prior to Christ coming, there was a lot of unknowns. If all you have is just the context of Isaiah without viewing the Christ event, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, the exaltation, enthronement of Jesus Christ, when you read Isaiah with that, I think Sonny refers to the canonical. Uh, the, if you read Isaiah in its canonical context in view of the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, the exaltation from it, it, it's not a different meaning. It's a fuller meaning. It's the full meaning, okay? So, so we, we should never read the Old Testament by itself. That's like, that's like reading or, or doing math problems without the answer key in the back. <laughs> um, another example... This is a plug. This is a plug for our class on Wednesday night. A plug for class on Wednesday night. Okay, uh, I've seen pastors, and I've been guilty of this. You, you will read Genesis chapter one through three without considering the New Testament. You know, you can preach Genesis one and not even mention Jesus Christ, and that's a that's a wrong interpretation. That's wrong. If you preach Genesis chapter one without recognizing that. The living word is there. That's wrong. It's so, so. So that's why. That's why there's this. The, the, Moses in originally, in his, in the original writing of the Pentateuch, the prophets. There's this fuller meaning that was intended by God. That they they were trusting in the Messiah. They were trusting in the promise of God, but they didn't know all those details. And and we cannot go back to Genesis to Exodus without reading it through the lens of Christ, meaning to say that, we're, not that we're rereading Christ into it, but we have this perspective of the end game, okay? You see, you see things that you will never see before. Someone prior to the coming of Christ could not see. So it's, you can't, some, some, some interpreters will say, no, I, I had one teacher like that, you know, from a Baptist background. He was like, don't bring Christ into it yet. No, that's not. No, no. We look at the original context. We don't bring it in. And it's like, that's wrong. That's a wrong interpretation. That, that's, that's really just focusing on a, his, a, a very strict, literal, historical, grammatical, and not considering uh, the Christ event. And, and, I, and I fundamentally disagree with that. So that's really where the, the rubber meets the road. That, that's the specifics here. Let's see. Alex says this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us belong to us, to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Yes, I agree, Alex. That's great. And uh, Christ revealed it to us. So, so we have some revelation we need to include. Um, okay, let's go on because we need to get some new, we need to go into some new 
um, content tonight. We are going into step number step number six. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to read. We'll go there later, but let me just go ahead and read Romans Romans chapter one. I'll put it on the screen later. You don't have to listen to just listen to it right now as I read. We're, we're continuing working through the method, working through the method and uh, uh, for Romans 1, 16, 17. So I'll just read you the passage again just to familiarize ourselves, and then later we can I'll, I'll put it on the screen. It's right here. So let me just hang on. With Romans 1, 16, and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we'll, we're going to keep coming back to this passage and just meditating upon it. I hope that, that it means something to you. It, it, there's so much profound truth there, and we're coming back again to the old. Okay, so let's move on here. What we're going to do now is we are going to do, there's different interpret, there's different ways of saying this fair enough. But we're, we're focusing t tonight on the passage's location and its surrounding context. So, you know, I've called it a context study. Some people, that's confusing for some people because everyone uses context in a different way. So I don't have that here. But really, it's a, we're, we're, we're doing a study and looking at our passage in relationship to its context to really orient us. Uh, and we should be doing this. If not in writing, thinking through it once we're good. So let's just do some introductory stuff here. Introduction. Uh, in this part of the process, the interpreter is identifying where his text is located with respect to the entire book. So uh, maybe you've never done this before, but when you're preaching a sermon, you need to understand where your text is in relationship to the entire book. Is it at the beginning, the middle, or the end? And this will be helpful because so people say, you know, I want to get some answers to my questions. Well, you need to know where you're at so you can look for your answers, right? Uh, to be specific, is it in the introduction? Is it part of the problem or part of the solution? Is it at the end of the book? So Let's really get into the details here so, so I can help us really unpack and understand what I'm saying here. So this is a basic outline of all books, okay? Basic outline, okay? You have an introduction, you have a body, and you have a closing or a conclusion, okay? So this is, this is not rocket science. This is basic. But it's very helpful when you have questions where your passage is uh, it helps you find where those answers are or where you should look. So for all books, you'll typically have an introduction. In the introduction, you'll, they'll give you the purpose, they'll give you problems, they'll give you propositions, they'll give you topics. Uh, then you have a body, okay? There's an argumentation. There's, in the body, you have argumentation, you have supporting information, there's solutions offered and examples. And then in the conclusion are typically summary, restatements, propositions. Perhaps the proposition is at the very end. It's, it's like a climax, okay? Last remarks, resolutions, okay? So, so this is the major structure. So for Romans 1, 16 to 17, where, where is Romans 1? Don't answer yet. <laughs> but I want you to be thinking about where is Romans 1, 16 to 17? Okay, because if it's in the introduction, then I'm thinking it's going to be giving me some main big ideas that is going to be then supported in the body. Okay, or I should say in the introduction in the body. If it's in the body, I'm looking for the main idea maybe being in the introduction or maybe in the conclusion. Okay, if if I if I am in the in the closing, then I'm going to go back earlier in the book to look for answers. So really. You have to be aware of where your passage is. If you're not aware, it's going to be very difficult for you finding, uh, finding solutions, okay? Steps to the process. So how can we become good at really doing these context studies? How can we become good at really 
understanding the surrounding context. That's, that's a big idea. Tonight, I want us to, to become good at uh, studying the surrounding context. So we have several steps here. So there's several steps to the process. So number one, prepare an outline of your book. So this, you don't have to write it out yourself. One of your assignments will be for this week is for you to, to find an outline and for every sermon you preach, when you preach that sermon, you should have, for that book, wherever you're preaching, you should have an outline, whether you photocopy it, whether you have a PDF, that you're aware of, okay, this is the structure, this is the blueprint. Can you imagine, where's Henry? Where's, where's Kuya Henry? Where is he? Pastor Henry, could you imagine being given a repair job on a large building and it's a structural repair job. And they said, we need this repaired. And, and you said, well, I need to see the blueprints to see the structure, what's existing. No, no, you don't need that. Don't worry about that. Just fix my specific structural. We have a weak column. We just need you to fix that one column. Talk to me for a minute. What would you do? <laughs> you, you, you were muted. I, I unmuted you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. It's replace, replace in... That's the, the, that's the main structure that supports the entire. So I have to demolish the building. I am going to give an example. I will not, don't try to guess the example, but maybe some of you will know. Don't try to guess it. Maybe some of you will know. I used to be in engineering. So this could be anywhere long time ago. Don't try to guess. Maybe some will know. But we were, we were doing this uh, repair work and we were trying to find out what was existing. One of the questions that was asked was, what is the size of the rebar and what's the pattern? What is the existing pattern of the rebar? Because we, they were gonna put a new load in the building and there's no blueprints and no one knew. And, and on top of that, the, it was, the, the, the design was asymmetrical. It wasn't a symmetrical design. And so the engineer actually said, I will not recommend putting any of that additional load because I don't know what's in the blueprints. I don't know what's actually in the columns that's supporting, the rebar that's supporting. And so he said, make it as light as possible. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that if you don't have the structure, if you don't understand what's in the bones, it's very hard for you to really understand what's saying, what's being said in your context. So the, the assignment, whenever you preach, you should have from, from a commentary, from an introduction, they have these in introductions, you should have an outline of your book where your passage is. So your assignment later we'll discuss. You're going to have to prepare an outline. You can find one and you can copy. I will allow you to retype it out. You can't copy and paste, but you can type out the same outline and you have to cite where you found it. But Moving forward, whenever you preach, whenever you teach, you should have an outline of the entire book that you reference, okay? Uh, no, number two, once you have the outline, this is just amazing, right? You need to identify where your passage is in reference to that outline, and you need to have some descriptive sentences explaining so that you understand where you are in that outline, okay? So that's, that's, the, second, that's the second step here. Number three, number three. So once you get the big picture, once you, once you describe where you're at, you need to summarize the preceding context. So you should be able to, in your own words, summarize the, the content of what has been described prior to your context. Okay. You should be able to do that. Again, we'll give an example in Romans. But that's something that you're going to also have to do. And then number four, you can, you can guess it. You're going to summarize the succeeding context. So if you can summarize the preceding context in your own words, if you can summarize the succeeding context, if you can identify where you are in relationship to the whole, if you have the whole, I as a teacher, I as, your, as an advisor would say, okay, I feel confident that he can preach. I feel confident that he could teach from that. So this is very, this is an, this is a, an important step. Uh, we can call this a context study, okay? I didn't label it that, but I think I'm going to use it. Just so, 
So I'm using context in the sense of the context of the book. Okay. Any comments or questions? So in preparation for a Sunday message, it takes three months before a person, before a preacher can deliver a message. Okay, so the, the answer is no, it does not take three months. What for me, okay, when I preach, I don't write paragraphs of the preceding and succeeding, okay? I think through the process though. I will read and I will I will I will do this all in my mind. I will have an I will go to the commentary, I will look at the outline, I will look at the preceding context, I will look at the succeeding context, okay? Now, in some context, in some passages that are very Mahirap, I will do this. It just depends. It's number one. Number two, I'm gonna use again because I'm an engineer, my my uh, undergrad's engineering. In engineering, I remember my calculus teacher. We're in calculus three, calc three, and I'm like Am I ever gonna use this? And he said, Tim, we have computer programs. When you're an engineer, you're not gonna be doing calculus. But I need, what this is doing is this is teaching you how to think because you will be using these principles, okay? And so the same thing is true here. I want you to be practicing. This is, this is belaboring a point to you practice so that you can become very familiar. So. Again, I don't want you to be stressed. This is an assignment for class. Do I expect you to do this for every single sermon? No. Do I expect you to do this for many sermons? No. Uh, most cannot. I cannot, okay? I would expect those young pastors that maybe, so he, Kuya Henry, you have several pastors in training, right? They preach maybe three times a year. I would have them do this for each one. Start them a month in, in advance and have them go through the steps. Once they become proficient and they're preaching more regularly, no need, no need. But, but there, there is that time at the beginning to, to work through this, okay? So for my class, if you want credit, you have to work through it. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, 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 I can feel the weight and I understand, Tim, this is so much work. Uh, I understand that. I understand that. And um, I want you to experience this. So at least you're thinking, you're thinking, you're thinking in context. I want to make you be thinking in context. Great question, Pastor Henry. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, no doubt people are thinking that. So I really appreciate that, that, uh, that question. And I hope that my answer makes you feel a little better. <laughs> you will suffer maybe a little bit in my class. <laughs> but I hope by the end, you will you will really be happy, and uh, I think you will. You know, I suffered through it in seminary, and I was so sad for it, but now I, I look back and I, okay, let's go on here. Okay, so uh, how to summarize. So I do, before we get into the, before we get into working through Romans uh, example, I do want to talk through this. Uh, identify, uh, how do we summarize? So uh, this is not a given, uh, and so I want just to talk through it. So what I summarize, what you first want to do is you need to, in, a, in the context, you need to identify the primary topic. Anyone who's going to summarize a passage, you're, you're not simply looking at a passage and then just canceling out some sentences and then just still saying the same thing. That's not a summary, okay? In, in, when you summarize something, you need to identify the main topic or the big idea in that in that uh, in that paragraph in those set of verses, you need to identify that. So then, once you identify that main topic, then you want to create a topic sentence, okay? And then you're going to once you create that topic sentence, you'll look at the different sentences. Maybe there's three sentences, maybe there's four sentences, maybe there's five sentences, and you're going to just describe right out. You're going to identify those fundamental ideas, so they're big ideas within that context. And then you're just going to write out several descriptive sentences of what's going on in your own words, okay? So, so and then you're gonna have a concluding sentence. So I have an example for this, but, but that's essentially how you summarize, okay? Summarizing, to be clear, is different than reflecting. So your reflecting paper was more interaction and responding in us. And so when the first people submitted the assignments, some of them were sending me summaries. 
And I was like, oh, that would have been good for this assignment, but not for that assignment. So we have to think about here we're summarizing. In a reflection paper, it's different because you're interacting and you're giving new information. Okay, so we have to be thinking about that as well. Okay, this is more, this is really following what the pattern that is laid out for us. Okay, at this time, let us go to, um, let's go to the Word of God. And then let's look at, actually, what I'm going to do first is, I'm going to, what do you, what do you think is more helpful to go to my example or to work in the word of God and then go to the example at the end? What do you want to do? I'll leave that up to you. What would you prefer? Someone give me some ideas. Do you want to see my example first or would you rather go to the word of God first and then my example later? Word of God, then example. Okay, Siggy. So, okay. So no, I, that's good. Let, let's go to the word of God first and then, and then we can go to my, we can go to my, uh, summary later. So just to highlight some things here, this here is our passage, okay? Right, this is our passage here. So looking at the preceding context, the preceding context is going to be from verse 15, you have this section here, and then also you have you really have one, two sections, okay? So the, the, these, are, these are preceding contexts. Okay, so um, I'm just highlighting, I'm highlighting uh, like bookends, okay? So what I want us to see here is that in most Bibles, I would recommend when you do this, don't do this purely online. If you notice here, you have this title, you have this title, and then you have this title, right? Those, those, those are helping you identify the topic. So that, that's, that's a gift. That's a gift from the, the translators. I would really highly recommend finding a Bible that has those paragraph form. Let me, let me find my Bible. So some Bibles don't. Some, like some King James won't have it. Some Nazi doesn't have it. What's really important, I'll just show you here. You want to find a Bible that's in, I just go to Romans. You want to have a Bible that's in paragraph form. And uh, if you can see here, it's in paragraph form and those paragraphs are set out and they have the, uh, just like here, they have these, uh, these paragraph titles. So if you do not have a Bible, if you're not using a Bible with this format, I would really highly recommend that you make an investment. It will be very helpful for you. So if your Bible does not have that, I really recommend that you make the investment. Not all Bible software will have that. My Bible software does not have it. It's just straight text all the way through. So you want to find a Bible that has it. All right, the next thing we're going to do now, so, so that's the preceding context, and then here we have the succeeding context, okay? And then we're going to go all the way. It begins in verse 18, and then it comes all the way down to here in verse 32. That's number one. And then you have another title here, chapter two. And then this comes all the way down to uh, here. Now, I'm just going to continue to go because I'm going somewhere with this. So just bear with me. So you have another section here, God's judgment and law. And then this comes all the way down to the end of chapter 2. Oops. And then chapter three continues on down until verse eight. And you don't have to do this far. I'm just, I'm going somewhere with this. So just, so just bear with me. And then you have one more here. And that comes all the way down to verse 20, okay? So there's several different sections, okay? Now, what I'm going to do now is let's go to, an, I'm going to go to an outline in Romans so we can get the big picture. So before 
this is critical. Before you start writing your summaries, you need to go to an outline to get the big picture. So I'm going to go. So if everyone can see this here, step number one is prepare an outline. Prepare an outline uh, for your book. Okay, so I, I found this is not from me. This outline is actually from this is from a, a commentary uh, on Romans. So I don't want you to create your own outline. I want you to go to a commentary and find, a, find an outline and then to write it out. And I want you to write it out because as you write it out, you're becoming familiar with the book. Okay, so just, just, so, just so I, I did not copy and paste. I typed this out myself. <laughs> so so I, I'm also, Sticking to my own commandment. I typed it out because this also, for me, even with typing a passage of scripture, so many times I will type it out because I'm able to reflect upon the passage of scripture when, uh, when you write it out. So this example here, I, I typed it out. I did, not, I did not copy and paste. So I'll just read through. This is the outline for Romans, so we have the big idea. The, the, this is from Tom Schreiner. Uh, exegetical commentary on Romans, Baker exegetical commentary on Romans. So the first major point is the gospel as the revelation of God's righteousness. So letter A is the salutation, letter B is the thanksgiving, and letter C is the theme. So think about where our passage is. This is the theme to Romans. This is not, this is not, this is fundamental. This is identifying the theme of Romans. That's our, where our passage is. So I am going to want to highlight, I'm going to want to summarize not only B, but also A, because A says the gospel concerning the Son, B says Thanksgiving, prayer for apost apostolic visit, and later we'll see the purpose, and then C is the gospel of God's righteousness. So, so for summarizing the preceding context, I want to summarize. A and B, because that's going to help me in my, in my passage. It, I, I'm going to see some connections there. And then look at Roman, Roman numeral number two. God's righteousness and his wrath against sinners. So that's a unified idea. And then we have uh, righteousness of Gentiles, the unrighteousness of Jews, the unrighteousness of all people. <laughs> so, it's so it's so exact, right? So that's why... If you notice in my separating out the preceding context, I was kind of setting you up <laughs> when you saw the outline. But, but if you look here, it's perfect. It's perfect here. One, two, three. Okay? And then, and then here and here. So I identified, I want to summarize these, and I want to summarize these. The preceding and succeeding. Okay? It really puts me in a good place. Okay? So... That's why I'm saying working with an outline and then seeing the text itself, it really is going to help you. It's going to help you so much. Um, just moving along here, just again to further orient us. Uh, Ro Roman numeral three is the saving righteousness of God. So actually, Manga Kapitin, our passage is almost identically requoted here. It's it, verse 21. There is a, a requote. So, so I want to be, if I'm preaching, I want to be thinking about this as well. <coughs> I want to be thinking about this. Because notice, just in the outline, notice the comparison. Look at this. You have God's righteousness, God's righteousness. You see that? It's, it's Maganda, right? I would not have seen that had I not looked at an outline. Maybe, maybe in looking at quotations uh, of in, in, the, in a cross-reference, but this really pops. This really pops. And it makes sense because this is the theme. This is the theme. So I'm expecting this going to come through, okay? And then look here. Righteousness by faith for Jews and Gentiles. Look at this again. We're going to, especially next week, we're going to see faith used a lot in our passage. So I'm seeing faith here. I'm seeing faith here. Maybe when I preach Romans 1, 16, and 17, I also need to consider this and this. 
So you really see it, the, the outline really helps us see that big picture. It really helps us see that big picture. And then the hope, the hope as a result of righteousness, Romans 5, 1 to 8, 39. And then you have assurance of hope, hope of Christ's triumph over Adam's sin, the triumph of grace over the power of sin, the triumph of grace over the power of the law, assurance of hope. And so, uh, and then God's right. <laughs> God's righteousness. So, I, I, I really like this outline. I really like this outline and this theme. It just is there. It's there. And that theme comes all the way down. If you look here, that theme comes down. Uh, there's a major transition here. So we'll talk about the big ideas is theology. Is Theology is 1 to 11. Um, so I like to this I like to say the gospel described and then here the gospel applied But notice although we're moving from theology so this is 12 to 16 Although we're moving from theology to practical, so there's, there's a shift. In 1 to 11, very little commands, very little commands, a lot of theology. This is what you are in Christ. This is what you are under the wrath of God. This is what has been provided for you. This is the hope. This is life in the spirit. This is the, the hope of glory, blah, 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 blah. But look here, even though now it's, it's do this, this, and this, right, uh, Present your body as a living sacrifice, use your gifts, uh, love, all these different commands in 12 to 16. But look at how, look at how <laughs> the theme still continues. God's righteousness in everyday life. So this is, this here is the practical. This here is the practical. Everyone sees that? Everyday life. So, we're moving from, so, so again, again, if I'm to preach 1 to 16 and 17, it's setting up, and oh, and then here, look, God's righteousness in, in, in Paul's mission. So we also have mission. We have mission. And then we have the final summary of God's righteousness. So here's something to think about. If I'm preaching through Romans, if I'm preaching through Romans, Romans 1, 16 to 17 is like the big theme for the whole book. And so when you're preaching Romans 1, 16 to 17, although you need to stay there, you need to be going to different trajectories. You need to be just touching, just a little touch, just a little touch in these other areas, wetting their appetite for what is to come. And so Let's, go, let's just go back really quick. It's the, main, it's the main topic or proposition, and it's going to be throughout the rest. So this is an example here where we're in the introduction. We're in the introduction, and now we're going to be going to different places. So we need to be thinking of our passage, not just in the specific, in the broader context, okay, in the broader context. So I, 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 I hope that you can see that now maybe – other books are not so nice. Okay, fair enough. Maybe this is like the best example. F fair enough. But I want us to see how this type of context study really can help open up your understanding of the passage and also prepare if you're preaching ex expositionally. Okay, so let's, let's come back here now, okay? So this is, this is the big, this is the big, uh, uh, the, the, the big outline. So, and, and, and this theme of God's, the gospel of God's righteousness. Okay. So I do want to highlight, let's, let's go back now to, let's go back now to, and focus in on how are we going to summarize? How are we going to summarize? Okay. How are we going to summarize? How will you create a summary? So let's go back to the word of God. Be thinking about this, not just for preaching, really be thinking about this for your small group. This is perfect for small group. This is perfect. This type of 
this type of uh, analysis because it really, as you work through your, your passages, as you work through studying a particular book, you, you're always having your eye on the big picture. You're always having that view on, on, on the big picture, even though you're in the specifics. Okay, so let's go back up now to chapter one. And what I'm going to do is, there's different ways you can do it. What I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking for myself, I would probably have, I would probably have, if I'm really doing this precisely, I can't remember how many paragraphs I had, but, but at least two paragraphs, at least two, two paragraphs. One paragraph here, one paragraph here, and then one paragraph for here. So what I'm, what I, what I'm saying is, let's summarize this. So this will be one, one to seven. And then let's summarize, let's summarize this. Now, you, now if you're looking at the big idea, the big topic, you could say, I, this is not necessarily wrong. You could talk about the, the, the main topic of verses one to seven is a greeting. and salutation. You could, you could say that. You do have the author. We talked about this before. This is the author. You have, you have the audience here. And then you have, this, you have this specific greeting right here, right? So this is the greeting, or we could say salutation right here. Right. I do want to say though that what we're missing is what we're missing is number one by by summarizing like that, what you're missing is this. You are missing this big point, and then you're missing that big point. Okay, so really what you have here is you could say you have, if you're summarizing, you have, you have one, you have two, you have three, you could have four here, and then you could have five. So is everyone tracking? What I, what I just identified is five big ideas. There are five big ideas. The author, the description of the gospel, and, and really these two could be connected, okay? So you, could have, you have the author, you have the description of Jesus Christ in the gospel, you have, you have the, descript, the, the, the calling of Paul, and then you have the description of, of the Romans, okay? So... So if you're writing a paragraph, what you would do is you'd have, you'd have a topic. You'd have a topic sentence. You can have a mention of just the author. Just a brief description of the gospel and Christ. The gospel and Christ. The audience. And then if you wanted to have a conclusion or some other thing, you could do that as well. So CT students, you can just have bullet points, okay? You can just have these bullet points, all right? Uh, MAT, I want to have like a paragraph, a paragraph form, okay? So again, you're just writing in your own words the, 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 the main topic, just describe the author is just the author is Paul. You know, the, the author is Paul. He's an apostle of Jesus. His purpose is his primary purpose is this apostleship to bring about the beads of faith. This is his purpose. So just, just have a sentence about Paul with some type of description, description of who he is. You're just, again, I want to just bring it back. The purpose of this summary is to really is to force you to interact with the context so you can become familiar. 
That's the design, okay? The design is I'm, I'm forcing you to become familiar with the preceding context, okay? And so that's all you need to do for that paragraph. So I'm, I'm thinking of right here, maybe five sentences, four or five sentences, just describing these things. So this is very long. Just give one summary. Just concerning Jesus Christ, who is both, who is both, uh, who is both the, the descendant of David, but really God's son, and he has been resurrected, something like that. Just really, just, just, just really like a, a summary line. You don't have to go into all the different specifics. It's just really, um, we know that the topic in the beginning is describing Jesus and the gospel, okay? Um, and then coming down here, verses eight, verses eight to 15, how am I gonna, eight to 15, how am I gonna summarize it? Again, the, the main topic, I would say the main topic is, is thanksgiving and purpose. So I would just write a sentence like in Romans 1, 8 to 15, Paul is thanking God for his work in the, in the Roman believers, and he's going to give the purpose for writing the letter. So that's the topic sentence. And then you can just describe in a little more details. You have this, why is he thankful? Because their faith is proclaimed in all the world. Uh, he's praying for them, right? He's praying for them. He wants to see them to impart some spiritual gift. So this is really getting to purpose here. Right, this mutual encouragement, these are connected, longing to see each other. And then really this, this, This is really the purpose, this harvest, this harvest and the preaching of the gospel, okay? So here's something to think about. If you're struggling, if you're doing your summaries and you're struggling, print it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm only going to require you to do one paragraph of preceding context. If you want to do more, that's fine. So meaning to say that for your assignments, I just want one paragraph preceded. So you need to determine, you need to find that one paragraph. It's going to be labeled in your, in your passage. And I just want one paragraph preceding, one paragraph succeed. Okay. I've done extra, my example, I'll actually post this when I'm done tonight. So I'm just, I want you to go back one paragraph and after one paragraph. Um, if you want to do more of that, that's, that's great. It'll help you more, but, but only one, one before, one after. Okay, but if you're struggling on like, how do I write this? I would recommend printing out that passage. So maybe it's four or five verses and doing something like this with a pen, highlighting what the topic is. What are the main ideas? Okay, and then, and then once you write, write them out, you can then list them here. This is, this is going to form the, the structure for my paragraph. Okay, so if, if you're struggling writing, you know, I've learned, and this has taken me so many years, and I wish I learned this sooner. It's better to come up with a plan for your paragraph and to write down a, a, what's my topic sentence, what's my supporting sentence, what's my conclusion sentence, versus just typing, just trying to type. I used to do that for so many years. And just recently, I will actually write out what's my topic, what's my, and I, you know, so that might be a, a much better, better strategic path for each paragraph just before you write it out write out the topic write out the content write out the support and then write out the concluding and then just fill in the blanks and then and then you can go into writing your own thing i'm actually finding that to be much more helpful okay A any comments or questions is this making sense i don't again want to stress you out ct does not have to write paragraph form just bullet point it just bullet point it like this one sentence per. Go ahead, Henry. Um, we will use our chosen passage as the work. Yes, Dama. Use your own chosen passage. Don't use this passage. Use your own passage because this is, again, this is preparing you for your final resubmittal. So this is, this is, uh, 
Uh, my hope and prayer is by the end of the semester, you can just resubmit with some tweaks after you get my commentary and comments. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be easier for you. So that's also why I have not yet handed back all the assignments yet because I'm giving you feedback because I want you to just make those minor tweaks, those modifications, and then you can add, okay? So it's gonna be easy for you at the end. You won't be stressed. You, Sunny knows, Sunny knows, right? At the end, everyone's typing, trying to do their projects the last week. You should be done if you, if you follow this process. So, so Tim, are the uh, is the structure uh, the whole book, or for example, the whole book of Romans, are we going to do the whole book structures of the book of Romans, for example? Okay. Or just the, the, just the first chapter, or? No, okay, so you're not doing Romans. You'll be doing your own passage, whatever passage that you've chosen, like Henry said. And I just want, so, um, Looking here, right? So, for example, let's let's use a different passage, okay? So, if I am if I am if I am in Romans, if I'm let's say doing Romans twenty four to twenty twenty five, right? Then it's just the paragraph before, so it's just eighteen to twenty three, and then it would just be twenty six to thirty two. So you're only summarizing one section before and one section after lock, okay? You can do more if you think that's helpful for you, but I'm only gonna grade you on, it should be essentially two paragraphs and like five to six sentences each. That's it, okay? That's it. Don't be, don't be, um, yeah, don't, don't do too much. It's, 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 so it's not that much. So your assignment, we'll discuss assignments later, but your assignment essentially will be finding an outline and then just retyping it out and you just will label where you got your outline. So you're, you're not creating your own outline. You're just finding a good outline that you like, that you think is good for your passage. And then you're going to type it out. You're going to highlight where your passage is in that outline. Then you're going to have a couple sentences. We'll discuss this on the, after the break of where your place is. And then you're going to have two summary paragraphs. Okay. And again, this is part of your final submittal. I'll just offer some recommendations. You can tweak it. That's why you should be saving, 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 saving. You'll combine into one and you'll hand into me one big project. And then you can see from beginning to end, you'll see the whole process, okay? It's uh, 8 10. Let's take a break. This, this page right here is just an example. This is an example project that I'm creating for this semester that. I'm just following, you'll be doing your passage, I'm doing mine. And so uh, you can kind of see, you, you should have already submitted the spiritual preparation, passage selection, location and salvation history, and genre identification. Assignment number four will be due next week, the, the background study. And, and then the assignment number five, which is also maybe, I'm gonna ask you to, 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 to have a goal for next week, but it's not gonna be a strict requirement. If you can finish that as well for next week, that's fine. But again, it's just, it's not hard and fast. If, if you need ex, some extra time, some extra days, that's fine as well. So number six is, sorry, number, number six. Number six is the passage location and surrounding context. I'll change that to context study. I was kind of going back and forth. I just think it really makes it, makes it, Clear, more clear. And so if you can see the bird's eye view of what I'm asking, I'm looking for this outline and then just a brief paragraph or bullet point of your location and then the two summaries. Okay. So let's go ahead here. This is my example. So uh, don't be stressed. I kind of worked through it just, just now, but yeah, so I'm just looking for an outline. So you don't have to have any specifics, just literally put put the outline, uh, write the outline out, double spaced. And uh, that I'll have to recreate a new PDF. It's, it's damaged now, it's, it's used, used already. And then, so here, so, so part B, which is your location of the passage. So I'm just gonna read this to you and I hope that this makes sense. So again, maybe this is a little extra, but, but I do want maybe, two to three sentences describing. So I have Romans 1, 16 to 17 is at the beginning of a long letter. So Romans is a long letter. 
Uh, it, it immediately follows the letter's prologue and introduction and is a summary statement before exposition. So Tom Schreiner called it a theme. It, it's a summary statement to, to describing the primary topic. So I'm a little bit different than Tom Schreiner. I, it's my unique, my, my unique uh, description. It is the summary text for a lengthy description of the gospel, which spans from Romans 1, 16 to eleven thirty six. Therefore, we should be looking for many of our interpretative answers in, in, the, in that section of text. So what I'm trying to say is that our answers for, if we have a question in, for Romans 1, 16, 17, I want to first be looking in that succeeding context of Romans 1, 18 to 11.36. That's the big takeaway. So I'm kind of drawing in. I'm, I'm describing where I am, and I'm, and I'm looking at the, the GPS, okay? So it's, it's, again, I'm just telling myself this is where I should be looking if I have an exegetical question, if I have a theological question, if I want to know what righteousness is. We'll, we'll look at making questions and doing questions and observations later. Uh, so I'm really kind of, I'm, I'm setting us up. I'm setting myself up to win. I'm setting myself up to win. Um, okay. Therefore, we should be looking for many of our interpretative answers in that section of text. Some of our answers will come from outside our text. We must understand the broader context if we are to understand the specific passage. So again, this is extra sentences. You don't need that. I'm just, in a way, I'm also <laughs> I'm teaching in my example. So Again, I'm just, the purpose of this description is to really orient us to where to look. And so if we say, where is our text in relationship, to the, in relationship to the outline? Okay, I need to be looking here, or I need to be looking there, okay? Now I have some examples. So these are just some summaries. So, so you, we kind of looked at the preceding and succeeding context. So here are my summary state. These are my, these are my summaries, okay? So Romans 1. 1 to 15 is the preceding context of the passage that will be interpreted. So even there, I didn't really give a topic. I probably should have had a better topic sentence, so uh, even I fall short. <laughs> we all fall short. Romans 1, 1 to 7 is the prologue salutation to the letter. It can, so here's, this is my description now. It contains the author and a brief summary of the content of the gospel. So I see how I'm, I'm now bringing in the idea of the gospel. It includes the author's primary purpose for his calling, uh, and, and it also includes his primary purpose for the calling. Romans 1, 8, uh, Romans 1, 8 to 15 is the next section and is typically referred to as the thanksgiving or introduction. It contains both a thanksgiving for the Romans church's faith and reveals Paul's primary purpose for writing the letter. In both contexts, so now I'm looking at 1, 1 to 7 and 8, 8, uh, 1, 8 to 15. In both contexts, the gospel and faith are present and highlighted. The gospel 1 to 1, 4, 9 and 15. So I'm actually specifying the topic. It's really big. Faith 1, 5, 8 and 12. Understanding the preceding context is fundamental towards understanding Romans 1, 16 to 17 and should be considered in the exposition of the passage. So this is one thing I want us to be thinking about, okay? Sometimes, to be clear, sometimes your passage might start a new topic. You might start something new. And so then the preceding context doesn't matter. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes it might have no consequence. You might say, this is a different topic. This is a new topic that's begun. I don't need to consider it. So it's not always a guarantee that the preceding context is setting you up for the next. Okay, sometimes it could be totally different. Okay, so you do have to be careful. And so I'm just really highlighting to myself that no, it's the same topics. It's, it's building towards this summary statement, which is then going to be expanded in the rest of the book. This is fundamental both to the preceding and succeeding. So I have to be looking in both places to, to look for answers and, and to look for understanding for my context, for, for my passage. Uh, succeeding context. 
Romans 1, 18 to 3, 20 is the succeeding context of the passage that will be interpreted. Romans 1, 18 to 32 describes the wrath of God coming because of man's unrighteousness. The focus of this passage is upon all Gentiles who have not submitted to their creator. So looking at Tom Schreiner's, I'm pretty much summarizing Tom Schreiner says, uh, uh, mankind, Gentiles are, are, are condemned under God's law, something like that. Uh, rather, they have rejected and worshipped his creation. This has led to all kinds of gross sins as God has handed them over to their own sinful desires. The list of sins breaks God's moral law. They stand completely condemned before God's law, and he is justified in sending wrath. So if you notice, the beginning is wrath, the end is wrath. So that's a summary, okay? Now, you're only required one before, one after. I'm doing extra, which is fine. It's just, I, I did this so that you can see some extra summary examples, okay? Romans 2, 1 to 29 is the next section and, and progression in Paul's argument that the wrath of God is coming. So God's wrath is coming to, to heathen, to, uh, to unbelievers. God condemns self-righteous Jews as well. One cannot consider themselves able to escape God's wrath because of circumcision or ethnicity. Whether Jew or Gentile, escape from God's coming wrath is on the basis of one's ability to keep the law. The Gentiles stand condemned because they have God's moral law written on their hearts, which condemn them. The Jews have God's written law and still break it. So again, if you notice, I'm getting that main idea. I'm describing the main idea, but I'm not, I'm not getting into all the specifics. It's, and, getting, and, and summarizing the main idea is very helpful for me. And then perhaps in my, in, when I'm expositing my text and preaching it or teaching it, I might be able to, to just highlight this to the readers to, to help bring them quickly up to speed about the surrounding context. So there's multiple benefits here for, for doing these preceding and succeeding summaries, okay? Romans 3, 1 to 8 describes the benefit of being Jewish. They were entrusted with the revelation of God to proclaim it to the world and exemplify it, yet they were unfaithful. The benefit is only if they are faithful. However, God st will still be faithful to his promise of salvation, even if his people are not. Paul returns to his major argument and concludes this section by declaring that all unrighteous, all are unrighteous before a holy God. All stand condemned before God's judgment and are worthy of his wrath. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of synthesizing Romans 3, 1 to 8, and 9 to 20. Perhaps I could have had another paragraph as well. But I hope you can just see that the, the, the sense, the, how a summary paragraph reads, okay? Again, CT, you, if you prefer to do paragraph, that's great. You don't have to. You can just do bullet points. So you can do bullet points, a full sentence, but a bullet point. It's not as hard as writing a, a paragraph, okay? Um, but I'll leave that up to you, all right? But I hope that's making sense. Let's ask a question. Any questions or comments? Is this making sense? Master, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, um, because you're familiar at my, with my passage. It's in Ecclesiastes, and there's no, uh, what do you call this? Uh, there's, it's the, yeah, a succeeding paragraph. Is the, so I want you to do two. I want you to, do, I want you to do two. Pre so that's a great question. So if you're... If, you, if you're the first, I don't think anyone else is the first, but if you're the first or the last, I just want two paragraphs on the other side, okay? Okay, thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, you're welcome. I will post this example because up until here, we've done the process. So I will post this example after this class on the, on, on the Facebook group and I'll email, I'll email Puyo Boboy. Okay, uh, so we have a little bit of time left what I want to do is I want to show, we did, a, we did a workshop on Saturday. I don't know when I'm gonna get that video posted. So to help those that are having some issues downloading, I know I think Chloe Bullboy was having a, uh, an issue. Let's just go to the one website. Let's go to, to the one website to, to show you 
uh, how to do this. So I'm going to go now to the cloud research tool. So if you, you should have the cloud research tool, if you don't have it, send me an email or go look for it on, uh, on the Facebook group. I'm going to click on Bible Hub or Step Bible and then Ah, we got it. Here we go. I'm so happy. So here, here we are. So the cloud research tool came through. I don't know what's wrong with Adobe. They probably want to, they want to sell me something. <laughs> not All right. So this, this, uh, this program here is essentially does what Theology on the web has a lot of the commentaries, but you don't have to download. So let's just, let's, let's use, we're going to stick with my, my passage. So we're going to go to Romans. We're going to go to Romans. Romans, and then I'm going to go to commentary. So let's go to expositors, Greek commentary. So if I click on here, this gives me the context. There's some Greek stuff here. You know, we, let's use a different one. Let's, use, let's see about Geneva. Let's, let's, do, let's just do Expositor's Bible. So let's go here. This is one of the things I was telling you about that they, they use Greek or Hebrew word to insert the point, and we don't understand what those words are. Yeah. And uh, many, many of the commentaries here at Bible Hub are using that kind of uh, commentary, using original words to, to, to bring home their point. That's what I was, I was texting you about. That. What, I, what do I do with, with those things that we do not understand the words? Yeah. No. And so I would just recommend, if you don't understand it, just, 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 just move it along. But no, I, some of them, like the, if it's an expositor Greek, it's going to be, they're expecting you to know Greek. So just use discretion here. But what, I, what I'm trying to offer here is that, so maybe I'll try to get the video posted tomorrow. I go through and talk about which commentaries are good, which are really, there's a lot of commentaries here. Like, look at all of this. There's, um, so, so Barnes Notes is very good. Cambridge Com uh, Bible with caution, use it with caution, but it's going to be good. Calvin's commentaries, Expositor's Bible is very good. Geneva Study Bible is good. Uh, I think Sonny knows Greek, so the, the Expositor's Greek will be good. That's the Nichols. Um, ICCNT commentary is excellent. Matthew Henry is good. People's New Testament pulpit. So th there is a lot of these are very these are very good resources here. So again. My preference would be for you to download, but you can also use this as well. Just make sure you're in some way citing. If you make a citation, if you make a citation, I want you to, to save that location. That's gonna be, this here will be your page number. This will be your page number. Does everyone see that? Can everyone see that? Your, if you can't do a page number in, online websites. So instead of putting page 15 or page 30, just copy. This is the one time you can use copy and paste. <laughs> just copy and paste. This is your page number here. Okay, this is your page number. When you quote someone, when you quote a commentary, it gives me the, the, the commentator, the commentary, the location as well. Okay, so, so when you're doing, when you're following the, the, the research guide from CGST, this is for those who are taking it for credit, um, use this, okay? You, you, for, for, for your outline, you could also look at the introductions as well. So still be using, really use this in combination with theology on the web, okay? And if you have, we will schedule this Saturday another workshop. If you are struggling finding an outline, if you're struggling writing, It'll be a workshop just for you to come to ask questions and to get help, okay? So maybe like an office hour from two to three. If you have a question that you need help, we will, we will meet from two to three. Um, uh, I, I, I do want you to, I, I would like you to, to, in advance, just email me like, you know, I have a question and such and such, just a generic 
or Facebook message me so that I can prepare and I can have an idea of who's coming. So I do need you to message me ahead of time. But we'll meet from 2 to 3 this Saturday to, to answer any questions that you have. If you're having issues downloading. Uh, the one other thing is that Koya Bull Boy had a problem with downloading PDFs. I'm getting a software where I can, I can go in and work on your computer because of the COVID thing and we don't want to meet in person. There's, there's a safe software that we're using. I'm using it with the U.S. If I have an IT problem, I can't take my computer to the U.S., so my IT guy will come through, and then he does it for me. So I'm going to try to meet with him to get, uh, to get access to be able to do that with, with you as well. So I have to find out the regulations and whatnot. But, but long term, that's the solution. So we don't have to meet. We can just meet here for, for IT issues as well. So. But specifically, I'm, I'm not going to fix your computer. <laughs> just helping you download, helping you use online resources, just to make a clarification. Yeah, I'm not an expert. We're just going on and then helping you as well. So um, any questions or comments, that's pretty much what we have for tonight. I'll just review the homework. I, I want to say that some people, you know, some people have been handing in their stuff late. Right now, we're still in this this uh we're in kind of like this this situation with covid so i'm not really taking off points i don't think i'm taking off any points for anyone would be late just keep doing what you can with the internet turn in as you're able to you know my, my only request is that you not be you not procrastinate but but each the situation is my here up here so just uh i will continue to post examples you know, my focus right now is us learning the content and then getting your assignments turned in and then getting feedback. So I'm not, this semester especially, I'm not going to be strict on grading, on lateness, on lateness. So let's just be working together, moving forward. Uh, you know, uh, my main focus right now is the content. And I, and I hope that you really see the process. I hope that you see the process and that you're, that you're able to meditate and grow. I, you know, I know that this, I know it, I was in your shoes before and, and I was stressed and I know that this could be very stressful, but I really want to emphasize that the more we can be, be focused in this process, it's just going to help, you know, it's, it's like when, we, when you learn a new skill, it's so hard at the beginning, but once you become proficient, it's just like you're relaxing. It's like you're relaxing and just getting it done. So I just, I, I, I want to really give a word of encouragement that, that this might seem like so much and like, how can I do this? But, but a lot of this as well is getting us thinking in a new way. And once you're thinking in a new way, there are times for me, I'll just write an outline and prepare some things and I just look at different things and I can prepare a sermon and, in a short or a devotional in a short time because again it's this once you're in this mindset it will become very easy for you so i just really wanted to, to encourage you not to be stressed let's just take it one day at a time um so next week the background study will be due um next week the background session of uh, assignment number four will be due and if you have time to be working on this is assignment number five so Background study is number four. Context study is number five. If you can be working on these two and, and shoot for a goal to be turned in the next week, that would be really good. And then we can have this workshop on Saturday to answer your questions. Pastor? Yes, okay, go ahead. Yes, I want to clarify. So um, homework number four would be the background study. And then the homework number five, How about is it the outline? Yeah, so homework number five is literally going to be, it'll be, it'll be four parts. Number one, an outline, okay? Number two, the, the two to three sentences describing your location, okay? Uh, where your passage is in reference to the main, the big, the big outline, okay? And then number three would be the preceding context, and then number four would be the succeeding context. So let me bring this back on the screen here. So this is assignment number five, if everyone can see that. This is assignment number five. And I will post, I will post, 
I will post an ex I'll, I'll post the example that I showed you for Romans so you have an example to follow. And then, yeah, I, I think Pastor TT said that the internet's really bad. I'm sorry, Pastor. Sorry about that. Um, so I will endeavor to get this video posted tomorrow if at all possible for those who don't have such a good. Yeah, so Pastor, so Pastor TT was asking about offline. Um, yeah, let's think about preparing something offline for those. Uh, let me talk to, to Pastor Henry about preparing something for, for, for people offline for this. And um, yeah, let's, let's, we're gonna have a plan for that, okay? For those who don't have good internet. So let's, let's think about that. But um, yeah, so this, this is the number, the number, number five assignment. So if your book is, if your book is under eight chapters, I want three, three levels. So what I mean by three levels is you have a Roman numeral, then you have a letter A, and then you have a one. So there's three levels deep, the outline. If it's more than, if it's eight chapters or more, just two. Uh, Roman numeral and then a, a major letter. So my example was just too deep, okay? It was just too deep. It had Roman numerals and then it had letters. So that's a two, that's a two tier outline. If you have a small book, uh, so five, four chapters, five chapters, then I only want, I want three levels. So a Roman numeral, one, two, three, letter A, B, C, and then one, two, three. That's a three, that's a three tier outline. And then the preceding and succeeding context, I'll just make it easy, just five sentences each. Just five sentences each. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Matt DeLima was saying the internet's really difficult. Let, let me talk to Henry about preparing something for for those that don't have that that don't have good internet access maybe in some way we could we could put it on a jump drive let's make a plan for that for those who don't have very good internet um, and then you can still just submit your assignments via via email yeah it's find, find, find an outline at least two levels deep for books eight subjects or longer uh, can you clarify this yeah, okay, so let me just, I'll show you my example again. It's only two levels deep. You have Roman numerals, and then you have A, B, C, okay? Uh, for longer books, I only want those two levels, because if you can imagine, if you have three levels, with the, it will be so long. <laughs> you will be, but, but, but for the short books, I want the three levels, okay? But you can find, you can find outlines with four levels, with five levels, and it's, the outline is like three pages. I don't want that. So, so if you have a very, if you have eight chapters or more, just two levels, so you're only going Roman numeral. If the outline has the additional, just ignore it. Just, you don't have to include, okay? If your book has only five chapters or four chapters, I want the three levels. Now, sometimes it won't, it won't have that. So yeah, just if, if, if you can, if, if you've looked and you can't find an outline that's more than two and you have a short book, then just use two and just make a comment. I tried, I, I looked at five different resources and all they had was two levels. Um, but but if, the, if, if it goes like to like little I, little I bullet point, like I don't, <laughs> it's too long, it's too long now. I mean, ideally, if you can look at my outline, ideally my outline is only, it's only one page. It's only one page at the most, if you look from, here to there. So I don't want it really, really long. Okay, we're looking at the bird's eye view. Okay, we're looking at the bird's eye. View. Any other questions or comments? When is this due? Assignment four is due next week with, and then also a, a, reflect, a reflection reading as well. I think it's the, the, the third reflection reading will be due next week, okay? So, so I, this is not due next, next Tuesday. Uh, if you can do it, that's great. Uh, maybe the following week, okay? So um, I'm not going to be strict on, on this being due next week. It'll probably be due the following week. But if you can get it done, um, that would be great. But it's not. Next week will be assignment four will be due. 
and the reflection reading number three. Uh, I might have missed the climate number four. Do we have we have the guidelines for the giving the background? Yeah, so I uh, I think I posted something. I'm gonna I'm gonna repost this once we get off. I'm gonna read convert it to PDF. Uh, this this is a good example. So if you follow this example. There is specific background already posted on the Facebook groups. You should look on the Facebook groups. It'll tell you how many paragraphs, how many sentences, or how many bullet points. Um, so you should follow the specific example on the specific parameters on, on Facebook groups because it has a template as well. Um, but, but I will post this as well so you have an example as well to follow. Okay, so this, this is an example because when you submit your final project, I, I want you to, to pull everything together and to submit it just, just like this, just step by step. But right now you're submitting each one independently. Okay? Okay, thank you, Tim. No problem. Okay, any other questions? I'm gonna, if there's no other questions, we'll, we'll be done early. So I kept you long last time. We're, we're done a couple minutes early and uh, it's getting late. So I thank you for your patience. Uh, if you can start working on your application for admission and getting me a, a, a picture, there's a couple more. There, there will be some more documents over the coming months that we will ask from you to build up your student profile. And part of that too is that wherever you go, if you're going to go into ministry, we want it to be really Excellent. So you go into a ministry and they say, and you say, oh, I've already have the certificate of theology. And they say, what's that? And you, you can carry this transcript that's more than a transcript. It'll have a lot of different, it'll be a nice like portfolio that you can submit. It'll have this course description for your courses that, and, and the level. We really want the, this. This is going to be uh, not just for your learning, but also as a, as a, as a as a stamp that you you've met this certain criteria and and uh if you ever were to become a pastor if you were ever to be ordained if you were ever to be in a, in a church maybe you went to some other island whoever is looking they really you really have this a description of what you've gone through it's really important to us so so over the coming months we'll also be asking for your testimony writing out your testimony writing out different things and then we're going to compile it this will be for our records and then once you graduate we also want to compile this portfolio for you with your transcripts so you go whatever church you go to you can say yes this is what i've done at evst it, it'll just be a great testimony to what you experience and to your level of, of learning and also we, we do want to do this in excellence. So can I have, Ray, can you close us in prayer? Dear God, we just want to praise and give thanks to what you have given us tonight. It's, uh, it's so much to do. It's another learning curve for most of us. But then again, Lord, nothing is impossible if we put our hearts in it. So as we prepare for the next week's meeting lord god may you be with us protect us always and continue to inspire us lord to grow in your knowledge and understanding lord so that our life will be will exemplify your presence in our daily life all this we pray and give thanks to jesus christ our lord amen